speaking of, I, what do we call these precursors? As yeah. a precursor to Bitcoin, Claude Shannon. Claude Shannon. He's Information there. theory. <laughs> like, well, I guess people may not know who this guy is. He's right. not as um, famous as some, but he, let's talk about who is Claude Shannon? What is information theory? And yep. then is that in some way too, well, obviously it is, but in what ways is it a precursor to things like internet, internet, Bitcoin, et cetera? Yeah. So it's a, it's a great question. So I, again, just to rewind the clock a bit, I, I didn't know who Claude Shannon was because I didn't study computer science or electrical engineering when I was an undergrad, mm -hmm. but I read this book, The Idea Factory, and it's all about this place, Bell Labs. And I was like, this place is really cool. And this guy is really cool, Claude Shannon. And so I start reading more about him and his work. And he's an electrical engineer. He's born in the early 1900s. And he's sort of Michigan, then MIT. And he's a, he's a big scientific mind with some very quirky ideas, uh -huh. right? And one of the ideas that he publishes in 1948 is a paper, a two-part paper called A Mathematical Theory of Communication. Uh -huh. And this paper then gets colloquially called Information Theory. And, you know, one, one description of it is so, somebody was like, it came like a bomb. Yeah. Right. Because basically what he did, as one scientist put it, he said, it's like somebody came in, asked all the important theoretical questions in a field and answered them <laughs> and then left us like the work of making those things come to life. Right. <laughs> and he did it in 1948. Yeah. And so people, people who aren't familiar with him or with information theory, information theory is basically it's the it's the it's the scientific field that deals with how do you transmit, measure and compute information. Mm -hmm. So before information theory, information is this abstract idea. Yeah. It's like an idea. Yes. After information theory, everything is quantifiable into what Shannon calls bits. So yeah. we know the word bit, like yeah. five bits, 10 bits, yeah. eight bit. He invented that phrase yes. as a way of describing what information was as a quantity. Yeah. But the, the, the basic field of information theory, it has a bunch of different um, concepts. They all tie into digital money. They all yeah. tie into the digital world in general. Mm -hmm. So I'll just run through a few of them so mm -hmm. people have some mm -hmm. familiarity. Um, compression. Why is it that uh, I can watch a YouTube video on my phone without it taking like two weeks? It's because of information compression. Part of what Claude Shannon's work did is it laid out a bunch of the systems and a bunch of the codes by which you could better compress information, right? And people might be like, well, what does that mean? Like, how do, what do you mean by that? And I'm like, well, okay, one idea is redundancy. So a lot of the English language is redundant. Yeah. At one point, Claude Shannon actually, in one paper that I don't know if you ever published, but he calculated that 80% of the English language is redundant. Yes. It's at least 50 and it's possibly as high as 80, yes. right? And if you don't believe me, like... When was the last time you typed in BRB to somebody or LOL to somebody, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so, so we use shorthand all the time yeah. to compress things. But even if you took a sentence, he has this sentence in his paper. It's like, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. You can cut all the vowels out of what I just said. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Mm -hmm. And most people can still read that yes, sentence with right, high fidelity, right. right? And so what he points out in that paper is like, if everything's redundant, if there's so much in the English language that's just fluff, then we can compress information and take it from, say, 10 bits to 5 bits, which is why people can watch this podcast without mm -hmm. it taking mm -hmm. years to load, mm -hmm. right? Because someone, there's an algorithm that is compressing this information. Information compression comes from this paper. Error correcting codes. Why is it that, like, if there's a skip in a video, it's somehow smoothed over? Mm -hmm. Or, like, there's a, there's a way that videos can be uh, transmitted at a frame rate that is actually a good quality these days. That comes from error correcting codes. Those codes were laid down by Claude Shannon. The idea of entropy, like mm -hmm. entropy as the measurement of surprise, yeah. right? That comes from Claude Shannon in information theory. All of these things he's writing about in 1948. And the was, bit, the bit, sorry, the bit is the opposite of that, right? Like, isn't yeah. the 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 bits the fundamental unit of information? It's and a fundamental it's the resolution unit of, of entropy, something like yes, that. Yes, it's a yeah. measurement of entropy. Yeah. So it's like it, it. There's a. It's a little bit of a convoluted thing, but it's like yeah. his line is: information is the resolution of uncertainty. Yes. And then the measure of that uncertainty is entropy. Yes. Right. And then the, that measurement is the bit. So yeah. here's like an example. It's like if you had a um, if you had a coin and it's got heads on one side and tails on the other. Mm -hmm and you flip it, you, you, you communicate one bit of information because you're going to get either a heads or a tails. Yeah. So it's, it's two divided, uh, uh, what is it? One divided by 0.5 because it's a half, it's a 50% chance of either heads or tails. Mm -hmm. 
If you had a, a coin that was had heads on both sides, you communicate no information right. because there's no there's surprise. No surprise. There's no yes. surprise. You don't that, know what's going to happen. That was the key. That information equals surprise. Yeah, is, information yeah. equals surprise. Yeah. Which, by the way, like it, it, you know, I'm not an I'm not an electrical engineer again. And for everybody who's listening, who's like maybe there's some PhD in mm -hmm. information theory, he's like he screwed that up. Yeah. It's like yeah, totally. Yeah. I could screw this up. <laughs> I didn't study the field. I yeah. wrote about the guy who invented the field. Yeah. And one of the chapters of the book does dive pretty deeply into information theory. I had information theorists read it mm -hmm. and sort of call BS on it. Mm -hmm. And they were like, no, you got it. They were like, no. they were like, is it as mathematical as we would like? Maybe not, but you explained it to a lay audience pretty well. Got it. Right. And the the interesting thing about information being surprised is like we sort of see this with the internet, right? Mm -hmm. Like the most the things that that captivate our attention are the most surprising things. Yes. So we understand it intuitively. What Shannon did is he made it into an equation. Yeah. He turned it mathematical. And so it, it there's so much of the internet that traces back to this work. But he remember, he's doing this when computers are like the size of rooms. Yeah. There is no internet. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. doing this in 1948. And he the way I describe it, or that we describe it in the book, is he turned information from something that was abstract to something that was fitted out for hard science. Yes. There was a time when you couldn't study, when physics wasn't hard science. And then right. there was a time when physics became hard science. Yeah. He turned information into hard science. And so part of what happens is like, he, he has this radical concept in the paper. He says, meaning doesn't matter. The mm. meaning of your message doesn't matter because I can measure it no matter what the meaning is. Mm. So that none of that actually matters. He creates this very elegant diagram that actually applies a lot in the world of Bitcoin and the world of cryptocurrency generally about you have a source for a message, you have noise, you, yep. know, you have a source, you have a transmitter, you have noise, you have a recipient, and you have the end of the message itself. Right. And there's a lot of, of like, if you think about money in the same way, like physical money is a very noisy channel. Mm -hmm. There's a lot mm -hmm. of noise in that system, mm -hmm. right? And part of the idea, I think, at least in my interpretation of it, of things like Bitcoin is that you are trying to achieve like the information theoretic version of money, yes. right? You're actually trying to cut noise and that's right. attacks out of the system that's right that's introduced by like other actors yeah money printing would be a massive source of entropy or noise into the yep. system because if money is this overlay on all the goods and services in the world and it helps us evaluate it mathematically well if you change the the denominator or you change the supply well then you're going to disturb that measurement yep process and so yeah it very much is that and it's it's so fascinating that um, the idea of mathematizing something that's that abstract. Yep. How did he do this? Like, how did he, you said he had led a very interesting life. Yeah. Like, how did this guy just birth this, all the theoretical questions and all the theoretical answers? Like, yeah, what's where, did the it, story? where did it come from? Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's a fabulous question. So it, and it is, it is what actually motivated, part of what motivated my, my, the book is how does somebody even come up with something like this? Like, mm -hmm. it's like, it's, it is a contribution that is on par with Einstein, right? And more people don't know who he is. So part of the ambition of the book was like, more people should know who Shannon is. So just of uh, the 30 seconds on his background, he grows up um, in Michigan and he's a tinkerer. He, like one of his first experiments as a kid was he rigged up a barbed wire telegraph. So mm -hmm. he could like communicate with a neighbor using this like telegraph machine, like those old tin cans. He could like communicate. Yeah, yeah. He's a wigwag signaler. So he's like, knows how to do this, like a Boy Scout thing, I guess. Huh. It's like, you can signal using flags. So he's super, he's super into codes. He gets a, a, a degree in mathematics and a degree in electrical engineering, and he goes to MIT where he works on one of the first computers at that time called the differential analyzer. From there, he goes to Bell Labs, and this is where things really kick into high gear. Bell Labs is involved in a vitally important part of the war effort. I mean, they're involved in a bunch of different things in the yeah. war effort, but one of the things that they're, they're responsible for is how will Winston Churchill and FDR communicate securely right, during the right, war? Right. Encrypted how messaging. Do you, how, do you use crypt yeah. how do you use cryptography to secure messages, transmit them over an ocean, mm -hmm. and then receive them without the Germans intercepting what those messages are? Mm -hmm. Because those messages have lives at stake. There are sure. millions of people who could yeah. live or die based on those messages. Yeah. Claude Shannon is intimately involved in the code making and the code breaking mm. of those messages. If your your listeners are probably more familiar with Alan Turing than they are Yeah, the imitation yeah. game. There you go. Amazing movie. <laughs> so Turing and Shannon were friends. Yeah. They were they actually neither of them had many friends, but they were friends with each other. Yeah. And so Turing was also involved in code making and code breaking. 
So you have Claude Shannon, very smart. He's working at a place that's involved in communication systems and communication technologies, Bell Labs. Bell is the phone company. Yeah. It's the only phone company. They have a monopoly yeah. on the phone system. And now he's involved in code making and code breaking. And so he is thinking for basically a decade about what it means to transmit information. What is information actually? And actually, it's, it, what's even more interesting is the word information was really not used that much. At the time, it was called intelligence. Mm. So it was referred to as intelligence, which has this whole other meaning, mm -hmm. right? He's actually the one. Like His theory is called a mathematical theory of information, not a mathematical mm. theory of, of intelligence. So he popularized the term. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and Well, I'm sorry. It's called a mathematical theory of communication. Yeah. And then he uses the term information, yes. right? And so he he's in the stew. And then part of what he does, and this is like part of what I like describing in the book, you know, he spends nights and weekends working on this paper. It's actually in a very weird way, a side hustle. It is the old, it's like maybe the world's <laughs> ultimate side hustle. He's doing his day job at Bell Labs. And at night and on the weekends, he was thinking very hard about this, about ab, how do you abstract something? How do you take something that mm -hmm. we're working with every day? Wires, phone systems, mm -hmm. technologies, mm -hmm. me transmitting something from FDR to Churchill. Like, what if, what's the what's the theory, the general theory mm -hmm. that can help us understand this? And that's where information theory comes from, is his attempt to abstract this away yeah. from what he's doing day to day. And he spends 10 years doing it. And, and so that's part of what the origin story is. There's a couple other little pieces in there, but that's the basic gist of the origin story. That's so interesting. What, what was that principle of abstraction? Is it just establishing generalities about things? Like Because uh, I actually have read... The mathematical theory of communication. Yeah. I read it. I thought it was very fascinating. A little bit above my pay grade, maybe. Right. But um, I am fascinated with this idea because it ties into how concepts work as well. That we we establish these generalities about things and then crystallize it in language. Yep. So I'm one. I'm just curious. Uh, what, what did he have to say, if you can recall, like about the principle of abstracting? About the principle of abstract. So it's interesting. He he gives a couple talks about this. Um, and and I, I I'll butcher the talk, but there's a great speech he gives about creative thinking where mm -hmm. he actually talks about the process of abstracting something, mm -hmm. right? Um, let me let me answer the question like this. He was someone who was comfortable working with his hands, mm -hmm. and he was an engineer. So he's somebody who built machines. Like later in his life, he builds the world's first chess playing machine. He builds the world's first wearable device. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, no, I'm sorry, not the world's first chess playing machine. It's the world's First chess playing machine they can do the end game. So mm. he the last like six or eight moves or something. He builds a rocket powered frisbee. He builds a, <laughs> a trumpet that can shoot flames when you play it. So he was a tinkerer. He was also somebody who was deeply involved in like the writing of papers, right? Especially when he was um, a graduate student and, and at Bell Labs about general theories of things like cryptography. So mm -hmm. the paper that precedes the information theory paper it was classified until uh, later, but it was called a mathematical theory of cryptography. Mm. So he was always thinking about the theory of a thing, right? Yeah. And like thinking about like, what is the general explanation? The interesting thing about the information theory paper is, is the diagram is really one of his best bits of abstract, is like bits, is one of his huh. best components of his abstraction. He just lays out a diagram for what every single medium of communication has. It has a message, it has a transmitter, it has noise, it has a receiving, it has a, you know, it has a recipient, et cetera. Yeah. And so part of it is he's just wired to do both the work of working with his hands and uh, working okay. with his mind, right? Theoretician, but rooted in practice. Exactly. Yeah. And I think one benefits the other. I mean, this is yeah, like part of, of what the genius is, is yeah. like he can do both, right? Yeah. Um, the other thing is, you know, he, he has an incentive to... Uh, to want to succeed in the sense that he's at Bell Labs, a place with a lot of bright minds, and they have a they have a they have a technical journal, right? So he is thinking about like like he's not he's not actively being told he has to publish, right? But because he's not an academic, but he has a journal that he can publish in, right? Um, one final thing here, and this is relevant to our kind of earlier conversation, which is he's also super bored at Bell Labs. <laughs> like huh. one of the things I discovered in doing this research is. Wartime work sounds really sexy and interesting, but for a lot of advanced mathematicians, mm. wartime work was really basic. Like figuring out how things, how projectiles can hit ships or submarines oh, better yeah. is actually not that right. complicated. Like it's like, right. it's interesting, but I read all these accounts of mathematicians who were working at Bell Labs and they were basically saying a version of like, 
when do I get back to real math? You it's, know, it's like, like grunt work. Yeah. yeah. It's sort of okay. like, like this is interesting. Because they're not at the theoretical frontier. They're no. just doing ballistics or whatever it is. No, you're yeah. not pushing the field forward. Yeah. You're not really doing. And so part of what noodling on nights and weekends on an information theory is, is just a way of productively mm, procrastinating. Right. Interesting. And by the way, I have a lot of sympathy for this. I did my first book when I was working at McKinsey. I yeah. needed a way to productively yeah. procrastinate. Yeah. And I decided to write a book about a Roman senator, right? <laughs> like writing, doing spreadsheets and client presentations was yeah. only going to make me so happy. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, I got to find something else to do. So I'm going to write this book. So I get it. And I think that's a part of understanding this is people, people act like, oh, he's some super genius. And like he had this thought all along. Part of it, he was just super bored and a little frustrated. And frustration and like frustration again. He was, what? Yeah. He, he, I'm sorry, I missed the... I was saying the frustration again is like yeah. generative. He was frustrated yeah. and he wanted something meatier, worked on this on nights and weekends, and he's involved in discussions with serious people about these topics and starts to see patterns. And a big part of this is is my, my it's, it's, it's in the book, but he sees patterns across things like poetry, mm. across the writings of Edgar Allan Poe, across the cryptography that he's doing, hmm. across things like stock picking, genes, all genes, all cells in our body are just information vehicles, yeah. right? Like a gene or a, 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 a something communicating in your body, like sending one signal or another is just an information system. Money is just an mm -hmm. information system, right? At pretty much everything is yeah. just an information system when you abstract it at a high enough level. Yeah. And he thought he would put something down on paper. I don't think he thought the field would explode the way it did. <sighs> But for his particular kind of work, you know, this was the 1948 was the foundation of a revolution we're still living through yeah. today. Yeah. God bless the tinkerers, man. It's always <laughs> the tinkerers. It's they always just, the tinkerers. They figure this stuff out. Yeah. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, click here to find more just like it and here to find our most recent episode. Also, make sure to like this video to help shine light on the corruption of money and be sure to subscribe to this channel to stay connected.